Hello and welcome to the 14th lecture in AC 1002. Um, this lecture continues on from the short introduction of the lecture, which is number 13, dealing with uh, the building envelope. So this lecture is going to look at heat loss. So from the previous lecture, we discovered that one of the core fun functions of the building envelope is to control uh, how heat is lost through the building fabric. So at a basic level, this can be thought as retaining the heat produced within the building, but can also mean stopping heat from entering the building from outside. Um, in Scotland, it tends to mean keeping the heat from the inside in the building, um, but we do have the occasional day in the summertime when it's probably warm enough that uh, the buildings can overheat from heat gain. This lecture is going to look at how the envelope helps to control heat loss through the fabric of the building and some of the background information that you need to know to understand how that happens. So we established that it's a, an important function of the, the envelope to prevent heat loss and the envelope being every part of the outside of the building uh, doors, windows, walls and floor. They all have to participate in that uh, prevention. And if we look at the numbers uh, or the percentages of where heat is lost, the most significant uh, places where heat is lost are the, the roof and the walls. Uh, windows and doors account for about a quarter, the floor uh, about 15%, um, but the vast majority is through through walls and roofs. So if we can design those efficiently and uh, consider how um, heat is being lost through the building fabric, then we can improve uh, the occupancy of a building, we can reduce heating costs and make it more efficient to, to stay in, in, in houses. So we need to think about a couple of things first of all. And core to this is uh, an idea that there is no such thing as cold, only lack of warmth. Now this isn't exactly what Sir Isaac Newton said, but it's the kind of the, the crux of it. What he actually said was, heat always flows spontaneously from hotter to colder bodies and never the reverse. And what that means is that if you have a hot thing next to a cold thing, the heat will pass from the hot thing towards the cold thing. And there'll be a heat exchange at that point. It's not the cold that moves the other way. Um, so when something's cold, it's just because it lacks heat. And that movement of heat is fundamental to understanding how a building fabric functions and how we can then um, help mitigate against that movement. So if we think about our building and the quote from Sir Isaac Newton, we can then understand that the warm air and the warmth from inside the building is, is constantly wanting to flow to the colder outside. And it's the envelope of the building and the way we design the envelope, the building and materials we choose that can help restrict that. And the normal way of restricting that is to use insulation. And we probably all know what insulation is, but effectively it's a material that partitions air or a gas within the depth of its, its material. So it's holding uh, air within itself and creating a, a layer which makes it more difficult for the heat to pass through. There's a couple of different types and usually we can break them into, into some subtypes. So the first subtype would be open fibre insulation. So this is very much like a, like a jumper or a sweater where there's a number of fibres that are woven together or matted together and the layers of these fibres perform a, a partitioning of air at a microscopic level. Um, it holds air within the, within the depth of the fabric. And the deeper the fabric, the more layers we get, the more air that's caught between it, and therefore the less heat that's lost through it. So things like mineral wool, 
tend to be open fiber um, insulation types. The other type is um, a closed cell insulation. So this would be something like a, like a sponge, um, but rather than water being able to flow through it, all the little bubbles within it are individual elements. They, they partition a piece of gas and that gas cannot escape uh, and water or new gas cannot enter that. Um, so kind of like a sponge, but not really like a sponge, like a foam, really. Um, not like cheese, like I've actually drawn. It should look like a sponge. So this traps uh, air within the material. We can also talk about insulation in terms of whether it's natural or whether it's man-made. And natural insulation overwhelmingly is manufactured using naturally available fibres or recycled fibres. And because of that, it's typically uh, an open fibre construction. It, it partitions air within its fibres and the gaps between them knit together very much in the same way that, that clothes do. And we can get these natural insulations usually as loose fibres. So we would get them as large bags of material that we could pour into a space or it could be uh, blown in by a machine or we can get them as blankets, so rolls of material which sit together um, and we can then lay them between joists and it's similar to the sort of stuff you see in, the, see in a loft where there's a blanket or a bat which is a semi-rigid blanket it's um, like a, if you imagine like a big bit of felt would be, would be considered as a bat it's something rigid enough to stay as a rectangular shape but we can squeeze it and we can bend it and that's useful for fitting between joists and between studs. Natural insulation is usually less efficient than synthetic alternatives um, if you were to consider the same depth. So if you had 100 millimetres of natural insulation and 100 millimetres of synthetic insulation, chances are the, the efficiency of uh, insulation across that depth would be less for natural insulation. The picture that we're looking at just now is actually recycled newspaper. So they would break up the, the newspaper into individual fibres. You can see little bits of coloured uh, ink and, and, and things going through it. It's also got some, some cotton fibres in there. So it functions very much like a jumper. Synthetic insulations or man-made insulations tend to be made using petrochemicals. So we're using uh, a, a material um, that, that comes from comes from the earth, but it's but it's not natural. Uh, it's processed and made into plastics, effectively, and then it's uh, blown or um, injected with gases, which can then make it into a closed cell construction. So things like phenolic foam or uh, polystyrene that we're, we're seeing behind this uh, slide here are man-made insulations. Generally, they come as rigid boards, so we would buy a board of a certain thickness. Um, it doesn't have very much flexibility to it, uh, but it can be useful where, where we need things like underfloor uh, insulation, so to go underneath a floor slab, as we saw in earlier lectures, but uh, also where we have um, spaces between studs, we can cut boards very tightly to, to go into them. Um, you wouldn't necessarily use all types of man-made insulation for, for, for the same function. Um, different types of insulation have different functions. And the opposite of the natural insulation is it's usually more efficient when you're considering the same depth. The, the, the amount of air caught in it and the materials that it's made of make it less conductive to heat. So therefore it becomes more efficient um, and it's better at insulating. So I was talking there about how something is more efficient depending on the depth. So how do we how do we measure that? How do we know how good insulation is? And we try and think about how, how well it conducts heat, how how good a, a material is at conducting heat and therefore 
inversely how good it is at resisting the passage of heat. So if we know the conductivity, we can, uh, for, for we know the conductivity for one material, we can then compare it with the conductivity for another. So if we're thinking about th thermal conductivity, something that's got high conductivity will conduct heat much faster than something that's got low conductivity. So the measure of materials capacity to carry heat is effectively what what we're talking about when conductivity and we would measure that in watts per meter kelvin which is uh, a measure of the, the the power that it takes to go through a depth of a material the lower the number the lower the conductivity and we then can think about the reciprocal of that or the opposite of that which is resistivity and sometimes you'll see conductivity listed as the K value or lambda. Um, and most building materials would be able to, to list this out and give you a conductivity value, which you can then use in a calculation to figure out how much heat is going to be lost through a depth. So the more conductive a material is, the faster the heat is transferred through it. And as we mentioned in earlier lectures, we're trying to think of each aspect of the, the, the envelope as a continuous layer around the, the building. So if you're thinking about a section or a plan, you should be able to put your, your finger or your pen on the insulation and trace it round through the insulation, through roof lights, through windows, through the junctions to the floor and all the way around without finding any gaps. And as I mentioned in the, the previous lecture, if there are gaps, then effectively there's a there's a hole. So what does this look like in, in, in practice? This is uh, one of my own drawings for a project that was done uh, well, eleven oh four. So two thousand and eleven. This was this was done, and we can see uh, a, a number of things. It's an, an incomplete section. We can th th there's a detail missing from the other side, but it's a repetitive detail. And there's a couple of gaps in there where I've missed certain um, information out to fit it on the sheet. But if we look at the insulation layer within that, it's continuous as it passes through the section. From the top going clockwise, we've got insulation packed between the, the, the beams, the steel beam at the top. So we would have to pack some insulation in there, probably put some insulation to the top. The insulation um, then runs down the rafters it joins in with the windows, so there's a little bit of insulation to the top of the windows and to the bottom of the windows. Um, we would consider the timber frame as part of the insulation, so where we've got uh, studs in plan or uh, dwangs and rails in section, they would be considered as part of the insulation because timber's a reasonable insulator. And then the junction with the, the floor and the wall uh, we would return the insulation from the floor up the, the, the wall to overlap with the framing so that there was a continuous line of uh, insulation and it works its way back up the wall between the studs and uh, matches with the, the insulation that's installed between the rafters. But within that last example um, and within pretty much every single building there's always going to be gaps um, and we we mentioned that you should be able to trace your finger all the way around there, there will be areas that are less uh, insulated than than others um, so if there is a gap in the insulation envelope then it's possible for heat to transfer from the warm inside space to the colder external area and we would refer to the path that heat would take in those circumstances um, as a cold bridge so if you have continuous insulation from your wall um, and then you meet a junction at the eaves and there's no insulation there because of the way that you have to construct the building, there is a possibility that that then becomes a cold bridge. And cold bridging is difficult to avoid at junctions and it's most acute at um, junctions around windows and doors or where there's significant structure or where you have to have steel. So as you uh, develop through your career, you'll probably come across cold bridging more and more and 
the, the, the methodology of trying to figure out the details around about um, single elements and co-bridging becomes more and more important. So in conclusion, buildings are quite expensive to heat and if we lose a lot of heat through the building envelope, then our buildings become less efficient. The addition of insulation within a, a particular building element can restrict the passage of heat and therefore reduce heating bills, make the building more comfortable. So aspects that you should take from this lecture are that heat moves from warm areas to cold areas. If cold doesn't come in, heat leaves. That walls and roofs account for the greatest heat loss. That insulation can be open cell or closed cell, depending on, on its structure. Uh, insulation can be man-made or natural, depending on the materials that it's made of. The insulation should be a continuous envelope and you should be able to trace your finger through each element that performs an insulating function, whether in plan or section, and that gaps in the insulation envelope might result in cold bridging. Okay, thank you very much for listening and uh, the following lectures will talk a little bit more about insulation but also about the other aspects of the envelope.